In over 30 years of ministry, I have preached with beautiful pictures behind me. I have preached with stained glass behind me. I have preached with an open window with cows behind me. But I've never preached with this behind me. But this is a beautiful and a wonderful sign because it shows that our construction is moving forward. And after the service, please take time to scope out the new worship area, to look around at the new hallways and new rooms that have been constructed. And um, let your building committee know that you really appreciate the work that they're doing in making this happen. And uh, Stuart is doing a lot to ramrod that, and we really appreciate all the time and effort that, that you're putting into it. I'm preaching from the epistle this morning, 2 Corinthians, which was read for us very well. And my title is Sufficient Grace. Which do you handle better? Praise or criticism? Trouble or good times? Now, I'm virtually sure that all of us prefer praise and having blessing and ease. But Proverbs 27, 21 says in many translations, a person is tested by the praise given to them. Do you ever think about that? There's a sense in which we're tested more by being praised than we are by criticism. I mean, we don't like to be criticized, but when, when we're praised, the risk is that our head starts swelling. At least mine does, if I'm not careful. How much praise can you receive without getting a big head? The Apostle Paul struggled with this. His ministry was under attack in the church in Corinth. His opponents bragged on being super apostles and criticized Paul for being humble. Paul's opponents thrived on being praised by people. They accused Paul of writing tough letters but being weak in person when he came to the church in Corinth. They criticized him for not using fancy Greek rhetorical style when he preached. They criticized him for not taking financial support from the Corinthians. And well, that showed he didn't think he was worth anything. They, they even used that against him. And Paul responds to all of this with, with sarcasm. Divinely inspired sarcasm. Look in uh, 2 Corinthians 11 and follow verse 16 through 23 as I read there. I repeat, let no one think me foolish. But even if you do, accept me as a fool, so that I too may boast a little. What I am saying with this boastful confidence, I say not with the Lord's authority, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we are too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Then he goes on to summarize many of the difficulties he had experienced, being beaten, being shipwrecked, being imprisoned. And in verse 30 of chapter 11, he wraps that up with, Who is weak that I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? If I must boast... I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Now hold that thought about boasting and weakness and we'll get back to it. But keep this idea that Paul was reacting to the boasting of his opponents and he was sarcastically offering his own boasting. And then we pick up in 2 Corinthians 12, 1. I, I must go on boasting. Though there's nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. To counter the attacks of his opponents, like we saw in chapter 11, Paul brags about his hardship. Now he allows himself to be pushed into telling about an amazing spiritual experience he had. But even in this, his modesty forces him to somewhat go in through the back door. 
starting off by saying, I know a man in Christ. But then verse 7, which we'll read in a bit, makes clear that Paul is that man. He's the one who had this tremendous vision. He's the one who was caught up into the third heaven, into paradise, but he could not tell what he'd seen or heard. He writes in verse 4, and he heard things that cannot be told, which man cannot utter. Now Paul may have been forbidden to share the details of his vision, but it seems more likely that Paul could not describe what he had seen. How would you describe color to a person who was born blind. I can't think of how I would do that. And I think Paul, if we had seen this glorious vision of paradise, of heaven, what he saw was so transcendent. There just were not words to describe it. He knew no matter how he tried, it wouldn't make sense. Words failed. Kistemacher writes, For Paul, direct communications from the Lord are holy moments that are not intended for public scrutiny. You know, not every spiritual experience we receive is given for public publication. Now sometimes God blesses us so we can share that with others, but there's times what God gives us is private. It's for us to help us with the challenges of our life. And an important principle that is too often forgotten today is that modesty and humility are high spiritual values. Principles that we need to hold dear and practice and teach and model. Now, in our text where Paul talks about paradise and the third heaven, I believe he's talking about the same place, just using different wording for emphasis. Many, looking at the third heaven, explain it to us that in that day, most people saw the first heaven as being what we, we would call the sky. And in, in the second heaven being out beyond the sky, the more distant part, the stars, the sun, what we would call outer space. But they didn't use that term then. And then the third heaven would be the place where God dwells, what, what we call heaven now. But as a direct result of this tremendous vision, we're told that Paul was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan. He writes in verse 7, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Some people would have written a book about this vision. They would have bragged and boasted at every opportunity they, they had. They would be the person who saw the third heaven, come to their meeting to hear about it. Man, if you had a supernatural vision like this, you might feel like you were really someone. Apparently, Paul was tempted to go there. Perhaps the so-called super apostles claimed visions and spiritual experiences and boasted of them loud and long. How spiritual they were and how much better they were because they had had this experience and they'd had this vision. And Paul was tempted to go there the moment after that vision, I imagine. Because God gave Paul a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. Now there are all kinds of speculation about what the thorn in the flesh was. Some believe that it was a human opponent who opposed Paul in every town he went to preach. Some believe that it was a literal demon. Now this is not my interpretation, but actually one person thought that it was a wife. <laughs> but Paul brags on being single, so that's not like... <laughs> Now keep in mind, I didn't say that. I'm just quoting someone else. But I think the best interpretation is the thorn in the flesh was in the flesh. It was some kind of physical ailment that caused Paul a lot of discomfort. Yeah, blues are an eye ailment. Yeah, perhaps an eye, an eye ailment. For Paul says to the Galatians that they would have gouged out their own eyes and given them to him when he was with them. And at the end of that letter, he authenticates his signature by saying, see with what large letters I write. Which somebody with an eyesight problem would do. Yeah. But he caused this problem, whatever it was, a messenger of Satan to harass me. Uh, other translations say to torment me. The King James gets the most literal as often. And it says to buffet me. To buffet me. And one author writes the phrase, to buffet me, is yet more descriptive. That is, the messenger of Satan hits Paul in the face. To buffet was to punch, right in the face. 
Buffeting occurred when members of the Sanhedrin struck Jesus with their fist. Both Paul and Peter used the word when they described being beaten unjustly. So Paul is saying that this thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, tormented him in such a way that it was like constantly having a demon there punching him in the face constantly every time he turned around. And this kept Paul grounded. Even though he was an apostle, even though he saw great miracles happen when he prayed, even though he saw many, many conversions and church started, and he wrote much of the Word of God, this thorn in the flesh reminded him that he was just a man who put his tunic on like anyone else and struggled with life and needed Christ to get through it. And then he writes, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that he would leave me that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul prayed three times and three times God said no. Matthew Henry writes, when God does not remove our troubles and temptations, yet if he gives us grace sufficient for us, we have no reason to complain. Nor to say that he deals ill by us. It is a great comfort to us, whatever thorns in the flesh we are pained with, that God's grace is sufficient for us. His grace is sufficient. Whatever you're going through right now, His grace is sufficient. Whatever you face in this coming week or this coming month or this coming year, His grace is sufficient. Paul had seen dozens, perhaps hundreds of people healed when he prayed for them. And yet God told him, no, I'm not taking this thorn in the flesh from you. I'm leaving it because my grace is sufficient and my strength isn't made perfect in your, in your strength, Paul. It's not in your intellect. It's not in your education. It's not in your speaking ability. It's in your weakness my strength is made perfect. Paul's prayer was answered. It wasn't unanswered prayer. But Paul didn't like the answer. You and I don't like the answer when, when we pray and we earnestly beseech God and we desperately need what we're asking for. And for his own divine reasons, our loving Father says no. Or not yet. Our character is tested when people praise us. But I believe it's tested even more deeply when God answers our earnest prayers by saying no. That's a test of faith and a test of character. In verse 9 we read, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul found unexpected grace in strength that he records in verse 9. He's saying, I'm not going to boast about being caught up into heaven and having fantastic visions. I'm going to boast about my weaknesses, about my failures, about my inabilities. He brags about being beaten, shipwrecked, imprisoned, attacked with stones, left for dead, being hungry, being sleepless, being cold. He boasts about not being a polished professional speaker. One person writes, in fact, the wording of the last clause in verse 9 is unique. For Paul literally says that the power of Christ may pitch a tent over me. The picture is that of God descending from heaven and dwelling in the tabernacle among the people of Israel in Exodus 40. It is that of Jesus who came down from heaven and dwelled as in a tent among his people, John 1.14. And I love that phrase. So that the power of Christ may pitch a tent over me. I want the power of Christ to pitch a tent over me. I want to show the reality of Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. I no, longer, I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. May the power of Christ shine through my weakness. I want him to pitch a tent over me with his strength to cover my weakness. Again, Matthew Henry writes, this is a Christian paradox. When we are weak in ourselves, then we are strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
When we see ourselves weak in ourselves, then we go out of ourselves to Christ and are qualified to receive strength from Him and experience most of the supplies of divine grace and strength. May the Lord give us a holy, genuine desire to live like this. Not bragging about ourselves, not looking for our own strengths and abilities, but handing our weakness over to Him. Handing our brokenness over to Him. Handing our pain over to Him. And knowing His strength is going to fill that vacuum. But in order to live like that, we have to stop trusting in being brought up in the church or having had special spiritual experiences that others have not had or having degrees in theology or experience in ministry or great gifts or talents we need to come to Christ with our weaknesses, our failures our incompetencies how off base we are when we see a gifted, talented people person and think, oh man, how God needs that person the Lord God don't need nobody <laughs> not Donald Trump not the greatest singer not the most accomplished speaker he takes the weak things the foolish things the broken things and his strength shines forth through our brokenness through our weakness we need to come to Christ with our weakness the message does a great job paraphrasing part of this passage. Peterson writes, three times I did that and then he told me, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. Now I take limitations in stride and with good cheer. These limitations have cut me down to size. Abuse, accidents, opposition, bad breaks. I just let Christ take over. And so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. Mm. The weaker I get, the stronger I become. His power is perfected, is made complete in our weakness. The New Living Translation paraphrases that, My power works best in weakness. And that tenth verse says, For the sake of Christ, then, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Content. At peace with our weaknesses, with insults, with hardships. Another translation says, So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, catastrophes, persecutions, and impressures because of Christ. And that's a good translation of that Greek word, eudoko. Think it good. Take pleasure in. Take pleasure in weaknesses? In insults? In persecution? It only makes sense in the spiritual context that His strength is made perfect in our weakness. His power works best in the midst of our weakness and therefore we're content and even take pleasure in weakness. Alistair Begg posted on Facebook yesterday, all we need to be is humble enough to acknowledge our need and open-handed enough to receive His grace. And that sums up this message perfectly. I, I, I could have read that and sat down, but you would have, some of you would have been disappointed. <laughs> But may we let Christ's strength move in our weakness. Do you believe that the weaker you get in yourself, the stronger you, you become in Christ? It's true. His grace is sufficient. My dear friend, whatever you are facing today, His grace is sufficient. Whatever weakness, failure, the strength of Christ will empower you when you embrace your inability and trust His perfect ability. Embrace your weakness and let his strength embrace you. A few years back, when I was about to graduate from a non-accredited Bible college in 1972, we were asked to choose a life verse from Holy Scripture. And I chose the, the ninth and tenth verses of this chapter. I, I cheated and took two. And uh, the, the reason was I had a moderately severe stuttering problem that sometimes made it emotionally excruciating to preach and probably made it painful to listen to at times as well. 
God did not heal that problem into 1986, a good 14 years into my ministry. But during those 14 years, I gave him my weakness, and he touched hearts through a stuttering preacher. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Come to the Lord with who you are right now. Whatever problems you have, whatever weaknesses, inabilities, don't wait till you're strong because you'll never come. Come today with your weaknesses. Let Him be in charge of your life. Whether we're talking about decades, months, years, or days, give Him all you have. And He'll make something beautiful of your life. Give Him your weaknesses and He will give you His strength. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.